We're going to finish up chapter 15 by doing some exercises out of the back of the book. Uh, we'll start with exercise number four on page 50. So on this one, Put Company issues 500 shares of $100 preferred stock for land. This land was carried on the seller's books for $40,000, but we're doing the buyer's journal entry. So that piece of information is extraneous. So we want to prepare the journal entry to record the acquisition of land for each of the following independent situations. And we'll take them one at a time. The first one is the preferred stock is currently selling for $120 per share. No appraisal is available on the land. So this is option A. So we're going to debit land in all cases. And we're going to credit preferred stock. And additional... Bless you. Paid in capital. On preferred stock. So preferred stock has a $100 par. So this one line, the second line item here, preferred stock at $100 par, is never going to change because it's always going to be 500 shares of stock at $100. So that credit is always going to be $50,000. What will change, depending upon the independent scenarios, is the various basis by which we record the land and the additional paid in capital. So in this case, the, the stock market price of the stock is $120. Well, it's 500 shares once again. And in this case, it's $120 market value. So that gives us $60,000 and $10,000 for the additional paid-in capital. So that's scenario number one. Situation number B is the land is appraised at $65,000. There has been no recent sales of preferred stock. So in other words, we do not have an open market providing us with a valuation of the share price for the preferred stock. What we do have is we have an independent appraisal of 65000 for the land. And that gives us 15000 then for the additional paid in capital. All right, so that was option number B. About C. C is the preferred stock is currently selling for $125 a share, and the land is appraised at $64 a share. So if you have, yes, sir. No, nope. you just record it because there is no, there's no been, there has not been any sales of preferred stock, so you don't have any way of valuing what the average is. So. All right, the share price. So in this case, if we have both, what takes a precedent is the answer is the question. So the stock is selling at 125 a share, but yet 
which would be 62,500, but the land is worth 64,000. What's more reliable? Just think it through logically. The appraisal or the open market? The open market is always more reliable. Every situation when we have in U.S. GAAP a structure of valuing, subsidiaries, all of this, if there is an open market in which the stock is actively traded, you're always going to use that first. Because a land appraisal is dependent upon, you know, comparables and a number. It's, an, it's, a, it's a guess. It's an estimate by an expert. Granted, I mean, a real estate appraiser has an expert opinion. They're accepted in court of laws and this, that, and the other. But quite literally, you can bring five of them into a room and give them a same scenario, and you may get six answers. So it's a guess. Markets are solid. That's... They're, those prices go up and down on a daily basis. So 62,005 then is what we record, and that gives us uh, 12,500 in additional paid in capital. All right. Treasury stock. Number 17 on page 53. Sorry. Yes, yes. Correct. Correct. You don't book it based on the appraisal because you have a market that overrides that value. Yep. Number 17, exercise number 17 on page 53. On this one, on January 1, West Company has outstanding 10,000 shares of $10 par common stock. This stock has, was originally issued at an average price of $35 per share. During the year, the following four transactions occurred. One, we reacquired 1,000 shares of common stock for $33 per share. We then reissued 600 shares of that for $35 a share. Reissued 300 shares at $32 a share. And then we retired the remaining 100 shares. So like many options, many aspects of U.S. GAAP, there are options. And when dealing with Treasury stock, you can either record these transactions at using the cost method or you can record these transactions using the par value method. So there's two distinct options. Once you adopt one of the options, you've got to be consistent. You've got to continually utilize the par value or the cost method. So we'll do the cost method first. So we have four transactions. The first one is the purchase of the treasury stock. So under the cost method, we're going to record the treasury stock at cost. Which in this case was 1,000 1, shares at $33 a share. And we're going to credit cash. So that's 33000 When we sell it, we're going to debit cash for the sales price. 3,600 shares at $35 a share now. 
That's 21,000 of proceeds. Then we're going to take additional paid in capital. I'm sorry. We're going to remove the treasury stock, that's the credit. That's 600 shares at the $33 for $19,800. And then the $2 profit that we're doing, because we bought it at $33 a share, now we're selling it at $35 a share for 600 shares. So the $2 profit of $1,200 for the 600 shares, goes to additional paid-in capital from treasury stock. If we sell it for a loss, in scenario three, we're going to sell 300 shares at now $32 a share. So on this case, we're going to need to debit the additional paid-in capital And then still credit the treasury stock at the cost. In this case, 300 shares at 33. So the proceeds were 9,600. The loss of a dollar a share, because we bought them at $33 a share, we're selling them now at 32, is 300. That's the debit to additional paid in capital from treasury stock. And then the credit of 9,900 is to the treasury stock account. And then the very last one, I ran out of board, I'll fix it, is we're going to now retire the last hundred shares of treasury stock that we had. Well, when we issued that stock, we issued it at an average price of $35 per share. All right? And it's a $10 par. So when we retire it, we need to debit the common stock account ten dollar par and the additional paid in capital on common stock So 100 shares at $10 par is $1000. The average price that we paid was 30 or that we received was $35, so the additional paid in capital when we first issued the stock was $25 a share. So for that 100 shares, that's 
2,500. And then we're going to remove the $33 for treasury stock in a credit. That's 3300 And then we have a $200 because we made two hundred we made two dollars a share on all of the issuance from when we bought that back. So that's additional paid in capital from treasury stock. Okay, when we, when we initially issued the 10,000 shares of common stock, we issued it at an average price of $35 a share. $35 a share. And I don't think this is... Can you see that? I don't think my recording is going that far down. Let me see here. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, we retired the actual stock is a par value of 10, but we have to remove the 25 that we first came in with, all right? So when we first sold all this, we sold it all at $35 a share. We were able to buy it back at 33 so we, in essence, made a $2 spread on every share, and that's why the additional paid-in capital from Treasury stock got hit for the two because when we retired it all, we in essence made a profit. Because when we first sold it, it we got sold it at thirty-five, but we bought it, it th bought it back at thirty-three. So we had a an extra two dollars a share, in essence, in profit. It'd be like selling something short. Do you understand how to sell short a stock? You sell stock that you don't own. It's a legitimate transaction in the capital markets. You can sell stock that you don't own if you expect the stock price to go down. Because then, when you actually have to deliver those stock, those shares of stock, and I don't know, I'm not a finance guy, I don't know exactly how many days you have, but when you actually have to deliver those shares of stock, you could turn around and buy them on the hopes that it's gone down. It's called selling short. This is, in essence, what happened here. You sold stock years ago at 35 and was able to buy it back at 33. So you made $2 on it. Okay? Questions on that? Let me uh, get this camera to go down a little bit. I have to take it off. Go down. Come on. There you go. All right. You can press the button in the middle of it, and it moves the camera up and down. So it was too high, so it wasn't catching this. All right. That's the common, the cost method. So what changes if we do the par value method? Well, the first transaction changes substantially because what we're going to record the treasury stock at is the $10 par value, not the cost of $33. So this... And a move for two per pens. I have more. So this, rather than being thirty-three thousand, is only going to be ten thousand.
we're then going to remove the additional paid in capital on common stock associated with this thousand shares, or 25,000. So what we're doing is we're doing what we have down here at the bottom on that fourth transaction in, under the cost method. So we're removing all of the additional paid in capital and then we're going to pay cash of 33000 and then we'll recognize this additional paid in capital on treasury stock. So here's that full 2,000. for the $2 per share differential between what we originally sold the stock at 35 for and the buyback at 33 So under the par value method, we're taking out all of the additional paid-in capital in its entirety for the full 1,000 shares, and then we're recording the additional paid-in capital on treasury stock for the $2 for lack of a better term, net profit that we got on the transaction. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I got confused because Bruce said that cash was um, the thousand dollars. I'm sorry, the cash is um, it's the other way around. Very good. This two thousand is above it, not below it. <laughs> Thank you. The cash is always thirty three because that's what we paid for it. Yeah, the additional painting capital is the line above it. All right, with me so far? Because it greatly simplifies 2, 3, and 4, which you'll see here in a second, by doing the first entry this matter. Because when we sell it, we're still going to receive cash of 21000 Only now we're only retiring it from Treasury stock at 10 because that's what you have. So we're still getting 21,000 in cash on the sale. We're going to credit treasury stock for 6,000. And then we're going to slowly start putting back in to additional paid in capital from common stock. The $15 which is the difference between the new sale price of 35 and the par value of 10. And then we have the same kind of transaction down here. Even though we're selling it at 32, we're going to receive the 9600 And now we're going to credit the additional paid in capital for, because this is 6000 for the Treasury stock, and then we have 6600 We have 3000 for additional paid in capital. That's backwards. 
it. All right, so we've got 300 shares at $10 par. That's our credit to remove it out of the Treasury stock account. We're selling it for $32, so we're, we have a over par of $22 per share. 300 shares at $22 a share is $6,600. And then when we come down to do this one, to retire it, all you need to do is debit the common stock and credit the, cap, the, the uh, treasury stock for 1000 each. And that retires it. Yes? Perfect sense. And then for your homework, you do have some treasury stock transactions. So that's the reason I want to make sure I covered that thoroughly. Because <clears throat> there's a comprehensive problem for your homework. Questions on number 17? I'm sorry, when, where did this 66 Okay. You're selling the stock for $32 a share, 300 shares of it. Ten of it is par, okay. okay? So the extra above par is $22 a share times 300 shares, 6600 And that's additional paid-in capital from common stock. All right? Everybody got this now? I can erase it all before we move? Okay. Okay. The... Th 6600 for the additional paid-in capital. Here, I'll write it up. That's the 300 shares times the $32 sale price minus the $10 par. Okay? So that's 22 per share times 300 shares. All right? Bless you. All right, let's do exercise number two. Go off to compensatory share options, stock option plans. And it's on page 50 again. On January 1, Sampras Company adopts a compensatory share option plan for 50 executives. The plan allows each executive to purchase 200 shares of $2 par common stock for $30 per share after completing a three-year service period. They estimate that the value of the option is $14 on the grant date and they expect 15% of the options to be forfeited and uses this rate in its compensation calculation. All right? So, problems such as this, you need to build a table. So, we have 2015, 2014, and 2013. You need to calculate... The estimated and then eventually we're going to have actual total compensation. Now 
then we've got a fraction of service cost. Service period. And then we've got the estimated compensation to date. And then we have previously recognized. Compensation. And then current. <coughs> All right. So for this particular one, we have 50 executives each getting 200 options, each option has a $14 fair market value, and we expect an 85% retention. If you multiply the 50 times 200 times $14 times 85%, you get $119,000. That's the total compensation. for both the first and the second year. At the end of the first year, you're one-third of the way through. At the end of the second year, you're two-thirds. And then, of course, we've got three-thirds in the end. Multiply the 119 times one-third, you get 39,667 of which you've taken nothing in previous years, because it's the first year of the plan. So that gives you total compensation expense of 39667 <coughs> Two-thirds of the 119000 is 79333 You've taken... 39,667 at the end of 2013, which leaves you 39,666 for your compensation expense for 2014. So, 2013 on December 31st, we're going to debit compensation expense. And we're going to credit paid in capital from share options. And that's the thirty nine thousand six sixty seven. For 2014, we have the same entries.
39,666. Then, at the end of 2015, the actual turnover was seven executives for the entire service period. And then, a week later, on January 6, 2016, eight executives exercised their options. So... So we lost seven executives, so that left us 43 executives, each getting 200 options at $14 each. That's an actual of 120400 120. We've taken in prior years seventy nine thousand three thirty three, leaving us with forty one thousand sixty seven dollars in current compensation. So two thousand fifteen. Forty one thousand sixty seven. Two thousand sixteen on January sixth. Eight of the executives exercise their options. That's a debit to cash. Eight executives times 200 stock options at $30 per stock option. $48,000 in proceeds. We need to remove the paid-in capital from share options once they get exercised. So we're going to debit the paid-in capital from share options And that's the 600 shares times the $14 for 22400 And then we're going to issue actual common stock now. At a $2 par. So 600 shares at $2. I'm sorry, it's 1,600 shares. Thank you. 1,600 shares at $2 is 3,200. Because it was eight executives, 200 shares each. So 1,600, not 600. And then the rest of it goes into additional paid in capital. Uncommon. Sixty seven thousand two hundred.
Okay? So far? Two dollar par. There were eight executives exercising two hundred stock options. So eight times two is sixteen hundred shares of stock at two dollar par, thirty two hundred. Okay? That's a fixed stock option. The very next problem, number eight on the same page. is a performance-based share stock option plan. So on this one, on January 1, 2013, Celis Company adopts a performance-based share option plan for its 80 key executives. Each executive is granted a maximum of 70 share options, but the number of options that vest depends upon the percentage increase in sales over the three-year service period. If sales go up 10%, they'll get 50 options each. If it goes up 12%, they'll get... Let me see here. If it goes up 10%, they'll get 50. If it goes up 15%, they'll get 70. That's what the two options are. All right? So if sales over the three-year periods from January 1, 2013 to December 31, 2015, if sales increase over that three-year period by 10%, they'll each get 50 stock options. If it goes up 15%, then they'll get all 70 that the plan has designed. Okay? So, We have 50 executives, and at the grant date, on, the, on January 1, 2013, they estimated that sales will, in actuality, go up 12%. So it'll be in between that 10% threshold for 50 and the 15% threshold. So our initial calculation is going to be based on the 80 executives, not 50, 80 executives getting 50 stock options. The fair market value of the stock options are $13.40. And this company is expecting a 94% retention rate. All right? So they expect to lose 6% of their... 80 executives. If you multiply all that out, you get 50,384. And those assumptions remain valid throughout 2014. So one third of that is sixteen thousand seven ninety five. Nothing has been taken. Sixteen thousand seven ninety five is the compensation expense for two thousand thirteen. Two thirds of that is now thirty three thousand five eighty nine. You've already taken. 
16,795, leaving you with 16,794. So that's the compensation expense, 16,795. And 16,794 for 2014. Then, at the end of 2015, actual sales had increased by 16%, and the actual turnover was six key executives. So they did meet that extended goal of 15%. So now we've lost six executives, bringing us down to 74. They're now going to get all 70 options. It's still each option is worth 1340. And that's a total of 69,412. We've taken 33589 for And they don't tell us whether or not any of them sold any of the next year. All right, we've got time to do one more. We'll do one more like this, a little bit more complex. Problem number five on page 55. Yep, yep. All I'm going to do is erase this part up here. Good? Is everybody good? Yes? All right. This one, this one takes up half a page. On January 1, 2013, Pierce establishes a performance-based share option plan for its 80 top executives. The term of the plan are that each executive is granted a maximum of 200 options after a three-year period. The exact options granted will depend upon the increase in sales over that three-year period. So if sales go up between 0 and 3%, they will get 90 of the 200 options. If they go up between 4 and 6%, they will get 140. And if it exceeds 7%, they will get the full 200 options. Each option uh, entitles the executive to acquire one share of common $10 par common stock, at a strike price of $45, and the options will expire at the end of year four. So as of the grant date, January 1, 2013, they estimate a fair value of each option at $15.50 and a 16% turnover rate. So start with that. We have now... 80 executives, a $15, bless you, 
option fair market value. I'm sorry. Next line down. $15.50 fair market value. We start with just 140 options because they, they expect the sales to go up at present time, at the grant date. They expect the sales will increase by 5%, which is in that second tier. It's in between that 4 and 6% that gives them 140 options. And they're going to lose 16%, retaining 84%. Multiply all that out, you've got 145,824. 145, 824, one third is 48,608, zero in prior year. The first year's entry is the 48,608. at the very last paragraph. It says, based on projections of past trends, they estimate its sales will increase by 5% by the end of 2015. All right? So then, in 2014, because uh, turnover is lower than expected, lower turnover, they revise the turnover rate to 14% for the service period. So the only thing that changes for 2014, we still have 80 executives. They're still expected to get 140 options at $15.50 each. Only now we expecting an 86 retention rate rather than the 84 that we had. So that increases our total calculation to 149,296. Two thirds of which are 99,531. We've taken 48,608, which leaves us. 50,923. So now, the end of the service period comes. At the end of 2015, Options vest for 68 employees. So in reality, we lost 12 over the period. Sales have increased by 7%. So now they've hit that top tier reward, performance reward. So we have 68 employee, uh, executives. Now getting all 200 shares, options, at 15.50 for a total of 210,800. So 210,800, three-thirds, 210,800. We've taken 99,531 which get, leaves us 111,269. In January of 2016, 50 executives Vet exercise their options. 
when the market price of the company's common stock is $62 a share. During the remainder of the year, well, uh, let's do that one first. So 2016, now February the 3rd. We had 200 options at a price of $45 a share times 50 executives. That's a share proceeds of 450000 We need to remove the paid-in capital from share options, which was going in at $15 a share. So we have 1,000 shares, 10,000 shares, at fifteen fifty is one hundred and fifty five thousand. So that's the one ten thousand shares at the fifteen fifty fair market value of the stock options. The par value in this case was ten dollars, not two. So ten thousand shares at $10 par is 100,000. And that means 505,000 to 10,000 shares at the excess over par, which is 505. Okay? And then the very last nuance before you can leave for the weekend is, is that during the remainder of the year, the market price declines so that at the end of 2016, the other 18 executives allow their options to expire. And I'm going to put that up here so that you can see it. So at 2016, on December 31st, we have to remove the remaining paid-in capital 